You have your Bibles this morning, if you would please go over to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and chapter 7. This morning is another theme message, thematic message, basically exalting the meek and mighty lamb. All right, let's see if I can fix our problem here up on this end. Thought we were on, and... Uh, All right, how about now? Does that work? Good. Okay. Uh, the message this morning from Revelation chapter 7, we're going to look at, and it's actually several verses from the book of the Revelation, three different passages that we're going to be looking at. And as we look at these today, what we're looking for is the Lamb of God, the most frequently used designation for Jesus Christ in the book of the Revelation to be looking for that and try to basically go through and, and understand that. What does it mean? And as you can see on the title slide there, he is the meek and mighty lamb. Shall we pause together to pray? Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to exalt the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I praise you for such wonderful mercy that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Help us now today then to be able to understand this grace, to grasp this grace. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would open hearts today, just as you opened Lydia's heart by the river at Philippi. This messenger can accomplish nothing in and of himself, Lord. We are totally dependent on you for a moving of your Holy Spirit to open hearts and minds. Help us, Lord, to understand. And especially as we look toward the end of the message, when we see those who will be tormented forever and ever in the presence of the Lamb, Lord, I pray that you would help us today to embrace, embrace our meek Lamb, who is also the mighty Lamb, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The story is told of a young big city lawyer who had a brand new law degree, and he made up his mind that what he was going to do was go out into the frontier and find a frontier town and knowing that he had these great degrees and that he had studied law so well, he just knew that people would flock to him, but he was greatly disappointed when he got out to the frontier town and he hung up his shingle and nobody seemed to come to visit him. And he wondered if he could even make it as a lawyer, a big city lawyer in this frontier town because what was going on at the time is civilized government was just beginning to come to be in those areas. An understanding of laws, basically people tried to settle things themselves and didn't really see the need for a lawyer. So one day he was sitting out on the porch of his office there in this frontier town and he was alerted immediately to some screams and yells down the street as the crowds yelled out and screamed and suddenly he saw a wagon that was completely out of control just barreling down the road. There was nobody there at the reins. There was only a terrified little boy sitting in the wagon and the horses were clearly had been spooked by something and they were running frightened down the street. And without thinking about his own safety, this young lawyer immediately ran to the side of the wagon, jumped in, grabbed the reins and was able to restrain the horses. As you can well imagine, his popularity went up in that little town. After that, everybody wanted to consult the lawyer about anything they thought they needed to consult. And so as the years went on, his credibility grew and ultimately he became a judge. Now in those days when there was a murder case, you would find that people would come from far and wide, 30, 40 miles away, just to sit and listen to the lawyers uh, declare the guilt or innocence of the accused. They looked at it as, as almost a form of entertainment. They would bring their meals and sometimes they would desire to camp out so they could sit there every day of a murder trial. And so there was one particular murder trial where the accused, it was very clearly, had murdered someone. It was the, the evidence was overwhelming. Everybody could see this was what was going to happen. And it was interesting that right as they got ready to declare judgment, the murderer made a specific appeal to the judge and he appealed for mercy. And he said to the judge, don't you recognize me? I am that little boy that you rescued that day in the wagon. And the judge with grief in his voice had to say to that man, sir, on that occasion, I was your savior. 
but on this day I am your judge. On that occasion I was your savior, but on this day I am your judge. That frontier illustration helps us to stop to think about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our meek lamb, in the words of John the Baptist, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, a reference going all the way back to the Passover as the Lord introduced his glory, introduced his revelation. He was helping people to understand it all throughout history. And yet the testimony of the book of the Revelation is this is the mighty lamb with whom everyone must deal. He is the mighty lamb who will sit as the judge at the great white throne judgment. So it helps every one of us today to stop to think about our Savior and our judge as we consider this illustration. Notice with me, if you will, as you read there in Romans chapter 7 and verse as we look at this understanding, notice the way this is put together and the way that we see when it says in verse 17 of, Roman, of uh, Revelation chapter 7, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away their tears. What a tremendous picture of the meek lamb. You say now, who is this lamb? Well, go back with me back over to Revelation chapter 5 just for a moment and notice that there as part of the introduction of the Lamb we see in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6 that John, this is the Apostle John now as he is receiving this vision from the Lord, he says, I, I beheld, I beheld, verse 6, I beheld and lo or behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living ones and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb catch this, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which are sent forth into all the earth. The main thing to think about there is this is the picture of the lamb who had been put to death, the lamb who had been slain. You say, well, it's very unusual it would say seven horns and seven eyes. What's that all about? That, that imagery, that illustration, is intended to communicate the horns are a reference to power, seven horns, he is perfect in power. And when it refers to seven eyes, it refers to his omniscience. You say, what does omniscience mean? It means his all knowingness. He knows everything about us. And this is by, the reference there is to the spirit of God, which goes throughout the earth. You see, even this very moment, the Spirit of God goes to and fro throughout the earth, and He knows every thought of our minds. He knows everything about us. This is the one with whom we have to do. This is the Lamb. And as you and I think today about what it means then to come into the presence of the Lamb, which we most definitely are this very moment, Revelation chapter 1 tells you that Jesus Christ is in the midst of the golden lampstands, and then he goes on to tell you that the lampstands are churches, the churches. So even this very day, we acknowledge and understand that our Lord is here and he's present with us. Every single preacher who stands at a pulpit to preach, his main audience is not the people who are there in the room. His main audience is the Lord himself. The real question is, will he declare what God himself declares in the word of God? That's the real test of orthodoxy. It's the real test of a biblical preacher. So when you see what's happening here in this passage, you recognize, wow, the Lord is really, he's removing every excuse from rebel mankind. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Here, here are men created in the image of God. According to Genesis chapter 1, all of us are created in God's image. You will never meet a human being who was not created in God's image. So next time you're tempted to say, well, those, those, those riffraff, are you talking about the riffraff who are made in the image of God for whom Christ died? Those, those are the human beings. You and I have to wrestle with that and, and just kind of think through that. So look what the Lord is doing here. He is removing every excuse from rebel mankind. You say, now, wait a minute. 
Why do you say that mankind is rebellious? Well, beginning in the Garden of Eden, here's what mankind did. It accepted Satan's lie. Satan's lie was, you shall be as gods. You're perfectly capable of being your own good God. And here's the essence of it. Mankind decided to declare itself as man king. Mankind decided we're going to be man king. We're going to be just like God. And there is the rebellion against God. But here's the amazing thing. This Lamb of God, which was slain, this Lamb of God that appears here in the Revelation that had been wounded with the deathly wounds as he had been put to death, he appears now as the one to bring about judgment. Will there be anyone who can stand at the, at the great white throne judgment and say, you didn't die for my sins? Oh no, he died for the sins of the whole world. So here they are having to confront their creator. They were made by him. John chapter one tells us, without him was not anything made that was made. He is their creator and he is their meek lamb of sacrifice. So when you see in Revelation chapter five that he is the one who is worthy to open the seals. He is the one who is worthy to open the scrolls with those peals of thunder that come out. You begin to recognize the one with whom you are having to do. God sent his redeemer to pay for the sins of repentant rebels. Those who refuse to embrace him now as a meek lamb will have to face him as the mighty lamb at the great white throne judgment. So today, the, the simple appeal is this, that you and I must repent. That is, we must turn. We must turn from our sin to the Savior. We must turn from our lust to the Lord. We must repent and embrace this meek lamb who went to that cross for our sins. Embrace him now as your meek lamb and embrace him meekly or you will find that you have to face him as the mighty lamb of judgment that is laid out in this passage. Revelation is really interesting, as I mentioned a moment ago, because it keeps referring to the lamb. You see, there's something that the Lord wants us to see and know here. And I encourage you to read through the book of the Revelation in a translation that, that you understand. Read through it for yourself. And notice how many times he keeps referring to the lamb. As I've noted there in your manuscript, you find that he uses the lamb 29 times. 29 times it refers to Jesus Christ as the lamb in this book. Even more than it refers to Jesus or to Christ, other names and titles for him, it refers to him as the lamb. Why the lamb? Why, why is he continually emphasizing the lamb? And dear friends, it's because that the lamb in his condescension, in his humility, in his meekness. Remember Matthew chapter 11, he says, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. He is that meek and humble lamb who was sacrificed for your sins and for my sins. And he is the one who is worthy to render judgment because he paid for those sins. And those who are unrepentant and continue to love their sin and embrace their sin, he is also the one who will render judgment upon them. So when you think about him as the lamb, we're looking here at Revelation chapter seven and verse 17. Notice the way this really comes out. It says, for the lamb, now here it's a reference to those who will trust Christ, those who will be regenerated, I think as a result of the witnesses, the 144,000 witnesses, and Pastor Rod and I will go through that. Don't miss tonight's message. Uh, Pastor Rod will be preaching from the sixth seal. And so I, I really hope that you will pay attention to that message. I'm speaking tonight at an ordination down in uh, Westerville, Ohio. But as you think through what is happening here, think about these witnesses who are going all over the world, they're preaching the gospel and some people come to Christ 
And when they come to Christ, they are rejoicing, just as you and I are rejoicing today in the Lamb. And look what it says about them. Many of them will give their lives. They will be put to death by the Antichrist and his forces. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 17, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. The original language there says he will shepherd them. It's the same word that is used, poimain. He will shepherd them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Would you consider here the, the meekness of what we are talking about, the meekness of the lamb? He is the one who is meek, and he asks you and me now to come to him in meekness. Aren't there things that humble you? Aren't there things that make you meek? I, I still remember, I think one of the funnier stories that I, I had heard, one of the funnier expressions I had heard was actually at a funeral. Many of you remember Becky Jolliffe. Becky Jolliffe passed away with leukemia. And Frank, after Becky passed away, I forget how long it was, he ultimately married Carol Jolliffe, and Carol, and then Carol Jolliffe. And I still remember at Frank's funeral, I was going through the line, I was talking to Carol, and Carol said, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Becky. And it really, yeah, she said, I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Becky. And I said, well, Carol, why is that? She said, because Becky got him housebroken before I got him. And I'm looking forward to meeting him. I'm telling you, I had never, I went straight home and asked Harriet, am I housebroken? I mean, that's a, and so there's all kind of things that humble us. There's all kind of things that, that make us meek. Chief and foremost among those ought to be this that the Lamb of God, the very Son of God, was willing to sacrifice himself in meekness for you and me. Why should we not have that same meek response to him? This passage is really amazing when you think about it. Look at verse 17. I've got it there on the screen. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them. Now, isn't it amazing? I mean, you have the shepherd lamb. Now look, isn't that just like the Lord? Isn't that just like what we see in the glory of God, that God became a man? You learn in the book of Hebrews that it says, he was in all points tempted, just like we are. He's a faithful high priest. He was tempted in the very same way that you and I are, yet without sin. He did not sin when he was tempted. He did not sin when he was tested. And that very same lamb became the shepherd. Isn't that interesting? He is the shepherd lamb. This is all part of the glory of God. People could easily say, well, God doesn't understand me. I mean, he's up there high in his heavens and he's way out there. He doesn't understand me. Oh, yes, he does. God became a man. He became a man. And he understood what it was like to be a little lamb that was led. Do you remember the story over in Luke chapter 2 when you see there that that Jesus, when he's 12 years of age, he goes to the uh, first, is really his first Passover. It's probably his bar mitzvah when he went there. And Mary and Joseph are looking for him and they can't seem to find him, but they're sure, oh, he's with family. And so they start to actually their migration back, going north along the Jordan, sea, Jordan River, down to Jericho, and then back up. They're headed for Nazareth. And after a couple of days, they're looking around saying, where's Jesus? We can't find him. And so Mary and Joseph, uh, at risk of their lives, really, because there were thieves all along that road, they went back to Jerusalem to find him. And they looked everywhere for him, but couldn't find him. And then they found him. And here's 12-year-old Jesus. And he's sitting there in the temple. And he's answering the questions of these doctors. And he's, answer he's asking them questions that they're scratching their heads and saying, I don't know what the answer to that is. And they're all marveling over, I mean, this is amazing how, how much wisdom Jesus has. And then Mary and Joseph said, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, hey, what, um, what are you doing here? And, and he said, I must be about my father's business, referring to his heavenly father. And, and they insisted, no, I mean, you're, you're going to come with us. Now picture this. 
Here's Jesus. He's smarter than Joseph and Mary, right? He's wiser than Joseph and Mary. He's more perfect than Joseph and Mary. Before I go on here, children, don't you think about your parents? I think I'm smarter than they are. I think I'm wiser than they, I think I know more than they know, right? You say, boy, preacher, you went from preaching to meddling really fast there. I'm just talking to the young people. It would be so easy for you to think, I know more than my parents. We all thought that at your age. But picture the model of Jesus Christ here. It says in Luke chapter two that Jesus Christ went down with them and was submissive to them. Look, if the little lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ could do that, couldn't you and I have that same spirit? It goes on to say in Luke 2.52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He is the meek lamb, and yet he is the shepherd lamb. He is the one who ultimately feeds his people. I noted there in your manuscript, and for those of you watching online, the manuscript is online this morning if you'd like to look at that. Ponder the way that the shepherd's everlasting caress comforts those who experience such great distress during the tribulation period. The lamb is in the midst of the throne. We've seen this all all over, haven't we? In Revelation chapter 5, that they're giving those around the throne, the 24 elders, the, the living creatures, and all the others, they're worshiping the lamb just like they are worshiping the one who is on the throne. That's pretty remarkable when you stop to think about it, but it's one of the most beautiful proofs of the Godhood of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ. So here he is, he's in the midst of the throne. It says, the lamb shall feed them, shall shepherd them. And so for all eternity, these saints of God shall have the satisfying sustenance of the Savior. Do you ever wonder about that? When we get to heaven, you know, how are we going to be taken care of? You know, what are we going to, what are we going to eat? How, how are we going to, to thrive? Well, This passage says that the lamb will feed them. The lamb will shepherd them. It says the lamb shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters. Jesus gives the water of life freely, even when he was on the earth. Remember one time he just got up and made the announcement. He said, hey, everyone who is thirsty, come to me. I'm the fountain of living waters. And if you went forward to the end of the book of the Revelation, I noted there for you in your manuscript, Revelation 21, verse 6, and again in verse 17, that's exactly the way it speaks. It says, come, take of the living water. Come and take of the water of life freely. Everyone who is thirsty. Are you here today with a thirsty soul? Are you listening to this message online and you have a thirsty soul? Here's what Jesus says. This meek lamb, he says, come. Everyone who is thirsty, come, take of the water of life freely. That's the kind of access that our precious Lord is offering all throughout the earth today, saying, come and drink of the water of life freely. And it tells us that the lamb shall lead his lambs. So he has been a lamb, and now he is leading us as his flock, as his lambs, into everlasting comfort. And again, You find a reference to this in the end of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Look, have you been through real difficulty? You've been through real trial. Evil has haunted and taunted you. And there have been times when you've been brought to the place where you are just weeping and you feel so helpless. Look what this passage says, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Anybody want to say amen to that? For the former things are passed away. These are the blessings of the mighty shepherd. Now, question, is he the the shepherd Is this meek lamb, the mighty shepherd, just like ultimately? I mean, is this this all future or is he our shepherd now? Most of you in this room can quote it with me. Psalm 23, the Lord is my, there it is. The Lord is my shepherd. And you read that passage carefully and here's what you find out. 
he says, all the days of my life, right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You get it? Even back in Psalm 23, he was talking about every day while you and I are picking them up and putting them down every day, the Lord is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. And we can say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the kind of shepherd he is to all of us. When you look at what's happening here in Revelation, it reminds you of what happened back in Matthew chapter four. We won't turn there this morning, but in Matthew chapter four, here's what Satan decided he was going to do. He decided he was going to hit Jesus Christ head on, okay? This was right after Jesus had 40 days of fasting, and the Bible tells you that, that he was led of the Spirit to be tested in the wilderness, and Satan said, ha, 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 I've got him now. Now I'll take him on. And when you see how that passage opens up and shows you the devices of Satan, the methods of Satan, the wiles, W-I-L-E-S, of the devil, you begin to see what's happening there. And here's the really cool part. In Matthew chapter four, the Lord takes the spotlight of the scripture and just shines it right on Satan so that you can see Satan's motives, you can see everything about him, and you can see how Jesus Christ used the scripture. One of the most heavily criticized books in the Bible by liberals is the book of Deuteronomy. Would you like to guess which book Jesus quoted from every time when he was talking to Satan? Every single time. It's, he quotes from Deuteronomy. And he takes him on. And he shows him, no, here's what the Bible says. The devil even tried to come along and misuse Psalm 91. And still Jesus confronted him with the scripture. So when you and I get to James chapter 4 and verse 7, and it tells you, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? I mean, how do you do that? And the answer, according to the testimony of what we have back in uh, Matthew chapter four, what you have there, the testimony is this, you use the scripture. You use the scripture and you obey the scripture and that's how you submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You say, okay, look, it's great that we have the example of the Savior, but wouldn't it be nice if we had like the testimonies of people who had actually done this? Well, notice what you have if you would go forward there to Revelation chapter 12. Turn in your Bibles over to Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. We've looked at the meekness of the Lamb. Now we want to look at the mighty aspect of the Lamb. In what sense do we mean that he is mighty and, and what does his power mean to us? Notice if you will there what it says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, I put it up here on the screen. Mightiness, the power of the blood of the lamb, look to see if we can find that. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, that's one of the angels undoubtedly, saying, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. It's like, yeah, right. This is wonderful, man. This is really cool. I mean, this is, I'm looking forward to that so much. And just to see the salvation of our God and just rejoicing and shouting and thinking glory to God. Now look at the contrast in the next verse, because in verse 11, it says, and they overcame him. Okay. Who's the him? Go back to verse 10 and notice what it says again. The power of his Christ for the accuser. Now, who's the accuser? If you went back and looked at the original language, you would see that when you see the word devil translated, it comes from a Greek word, diabolos, and here's the way that word is used, slanderer. He's the liar. John chapter 8, he's the father of lies. You and I know that he is the slanderer, he is the liar, he is the accuser. And notice what it says about him. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And 
They overcame him, the accuser, the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. All right? Let's step back just for a minute and see if we can picture this. The Bible actually speaks of three heavens. You say, I had no idea. It's only three heavens. Well, here's what we mean by that. Revelation chapter 5, you have the abode of God where the throne of God is. That's the way you and I usually think about heaven. But then you could also read in passages like Psalm 19, and it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And he goes on to talk about the sun as it moves. And you realize, oh, the heavens he's talking about there are what you and I would call the, the astronomical heavens. You know, you, you'll hear somebody say, oh, go out and, and look into the heavens, you know, and, and you, what do you see at night? You see the beautiful stars. Oh, isn't that a beautiful moon we're seeing tonight? That's all in the heavens. And so there's a second use of the word heaven. And then you could go on to Genesis, back over to Genesis chapter 1. I noted it for you there in your outline. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, it speaks of the fact that in there, there is the, the area where the birds fly. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20, that we speak of that as the heavens, the, you, the, the, the planes fly, the birds fly in the heavens. Now, here's what's really interesting. If you went back and, and looked at this, I listed the reference for you there on your manuscript. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, Jesus testified that Satan had been cast out. He said, I saw Satan fall. Now, question, fall from and fall to where? He doesn't tell us to where he fell. He tells us from where he fell. And here's what we learn in the scriptures, that Satan was cast out of heaven. We're going to see this later on. We get in the book of the Revelation. We're going to see the third of the angels, who are now demons, went with him. And yet, when you go to a passage like Job chapter 1, again, I listed it for you in your notes there. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Job 2, 1 through 3. Here's what you find out. You find out that Satan is somehow presenting himself, and he is accusing people like Job. The Lord said about Job, he's perfect and upright in all his ways. Have you considered him? Okay, so how is Satan making that accusation? And the best explanations I've seen for this is he's cast out of the throne room of God. We'll come back to this because he was the ultimate angel. Satan was the ultimate Lucifer he's often referred to. We'll go back to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 about the five I wills. I will be like the most high. I will ascend, get my throne above the heavens. He was cast out of that, but apparently in the astronomical heavens, he can still launch these accusations. He can still throw these accusations at the brothers and sisters in Christ, the believers. He can still lambast them and he can still slander them. What's happening here in this passage is that he is ultimately cast even out of the astronomical heavens and he's cast down to the earth. Let me encourage you when you get a chance to read Revelation 12, 10 through 12, here's what you find out. You find out that now Satan is not only cast out as he was cast out of the ultimate throne of God, now he is cast down to the earth. Revelation chapter 12 tells you, woe unto those on the earth and in the sea, because here's what Satan knows according to Revelation chapter 12. He knows that his time is very short. He knows he has almost no time left, so what is he going to do? He is going to wreak havoc on this earth. Dear friend, the Bible testifies this is the time of the great tribulation. This will be the worst time in the whole history of the world that is coming because Satan knows his time is short. He knows what God has said is true. He's going to do his worst, everything he can to destroy and hurt all people. And one of the ways he's going to do it is by his accusations, by his slandering techniques. Notice what this passage says. And again, up here on the screen, notice what it says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they, the believers, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. They overcame him in his role as slanderer, as liar. 
Have, has it ever happened to you that you've had lies that have been manufactured about you? I mean manufactured out of whole cloth where somebody lied about you and you knew it was a lie. You couldn't prove it was a lie to some people's satisfaction, but you knew it was a lie. Okay, question. How do you overcome that? Here's the answer. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Do you have a conscience that has been cleansed by the blood of the lamb? Are you able to confess and apply when you sin and you know that you sin? Do you have the ability to go before the Lord and know that if you confess your sin, that he is both faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness? What these people could say is, they, it doesn't matter how much that slanderer, it doesn't matter how much that accuser slanders them, they know that they have a clean conscience in the sight of God. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, their conscience, and by the testimony, by the word of their testimony. They kept testifying. What Satan's trying to do today is he's trying to get believers to shut up. He is trying to silence believers. He wants none of it. Why? Because we're always using the word of God. We're always out there just trying to use the scripture. My wife and I had a wonderful opportunity to testify to someone just yesterday, just using the scripture and sharing what the scripture says. That's what Satan is trying to bring to an end. He is trying to stop it. But even about these, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And don't miss the fact that they said, they love not their lives even unto death. Look, how does this work? Here's what it says in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Paul writing to the Romans, he said, shortly, shortly now, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The Bible's very plain that you and I should not rail against the devil. That's the book of Jude. E even the archangel would not rail against the devil. He would say, the Lord rebuke you. But here's what we know. The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under our feet. And this is the joy with which we come to this passage today. So as you look at those two verses together, what should we do? What's our carry away? Well, praise God for Jesus Christ because he says, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. It's like, whoa, this is going to be wonderful. And then thank God that the one who slanders believers will be dealt with ultimately. The accuser of our brothers is cast down, we see here. He, he's cast, the one who accused them day and night is cast down. And then ultimately, what you and I can testify to is we know that our Lord is going to be very successful. It's kind of fascinating when you think about slander and lies. There's a really fascinating passage over in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3 where Peter is confronting Ananias. And here's what he asked him. He says, why has Satan moved you to lie to the Holy Spirit? How does that work? I mean, what is the instrumentality that, that Satan uses to get people to lie? I've, I've studied that and I'm doing my best to try to find more answers about that in scripture, but it is true. But here's what we know in the words of Martin Luther. Do you remember this when he uh, composed A Mighty Fortress is Our God? I'm sure it was in German and it's been translated over to English for us. The prince of darkness, there's the devil, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Would you thank God today that there are those who overcome him by the blood of the lamb? And it's exactly what you can do today. You can look at the power. We, we sing, there is power, power in the blood. Do you know the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse a guilty conscience, to give you a right standing before God and to be able to respond to the devil with all of his accusations? These people did not love their lives even unto death. In other words, Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, his instrument of death. It would be for you and me today like saying, take up his electric chair. Let him deny himself, 
take up his cross and follow me. Why? Because you love the Lord more than you love your own life. That's why. Do you love the Lord more than you love your own life? That's the testimony of these that succeeded there before the throne of God. Finally, and I find this the most terrifying, turn over, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10. There is much more that we can say about the meek and mighty lamb, and perhaps we will return to this on another occasion on this theme. But I just need for you to pay really close attention to what you're seeing here in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 10, because quite frankly, this one really shook me up. I, I found myself praying for a number of people this week and thinking about what this passage is saying. It says, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, okay, who's that? That's the Antichrist, and his image, the statue he sets up and the false prophet uh, enables it to uh, teach and say things. It says, if any man worships the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, this is the reference to the mark of the beast, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, catch this, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. What does that mean? It means it's poured out in full strength. The wrath of God without poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Friends, it's one thing to preach a message. It's quite another thing for you and me to grapple with what you find in this passage. This passage is telling you that there will be those who will be in the lake of fire and brimstone. You say, what's brimstone? It's burning sulfur. There will be those who will be in the lake of fire for all eternity. Think about what this passage is saying in the presence of the Lamb. They will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Friends, stop to think about just how tragic this really is. Here is the meek Lamb who offered himself for the sins of the world. He is our Lord. He is our creator. All things are of him and through him and to him. He is our creator. He's our redeemer who offers himself as the sacrifice for our sins, as our meek lamb. And those who say, no, no. The ultimate expression of mankind being man king is ultimately here with the Antichrist. I suspect what he'll try to do is say, we're all God together. That's my suspicion. But it's the ultimate expression of saying, no, I'll worship the Antichrist. I'll, I'll follow after him. You say, Pastor, I would never do that. I want you to remember the scripture says that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. In other words, if you have not embraced the meek lamb, Jesus Christ, as the only way of salvation, as the only way for you to get to heaven, then you are ultimately already believing in the spirit of Antichrist. That's terrifying, isn't it? It is terrifying. And ultimately, how tragically, there will be people who will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb forever. This brings every one of us to the point of decision. Will you embrace him now as the meek lamb who was sacrificed for your sins? Or do you intend to have to face him as the mighty lamb at the great white throne judgment and be condemned to the lake of fire for all eternity, tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Two times in my Christian experience, one from a relative, one from somebody I was witnessing to said, you're just trying to scare people. Oh, you, you start talking about hell, a tract I wrote, it's out here in the foyer about life's most important question. They said, we're not trying to just scare people. It is not my desire to try to somehow 
gin something up to try to scare people with it. That's called manipulation. But if I'm teaching you the true word of God this morning and I am preaching to you the true word of God, then you've got to understand that the fear in this passage is the fear of God and it's very real. This is not some mythical, fanciful tale. This is reality. So dear friends today, when you let that sink down into your ears using the words of Jesus Christ, would you not today say, wait a minute, I gotta wake up here. I, I've gotta confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Perhaps there's been some time in the past when you prayed a prayer and you were trying not to go to hell, right? I, I remember over and over again when I was a teenager, when I go to bed at night, Lord, please don't send me to hell. Lord, please don't send me to hell. But I wasn't willing to acknowledge my sin and my rebellion against God. And ultimately, the Lord drew me to himself. The scripture is very plain in John 6. No man can come except my Father which is in heaven draw him. But do you know how he draws people? He draws people through the preaching of the word in a message just like this. He brings people to the point of decision. So here's the decision today. Will you embrace him as your meek lamb, your sacrificial lamb? Or do you intend to face him as your judge, savior or judge? You're making a choice even now. May we bow our heads together. Friend, which one will it be? Just like that frontier lawyer said, that murderer, I was your savior, but now I'm your judge. Why not this moment turn from your sins to the savior? Why not this moment cry out to him and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I beg you to save me. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be in charge. You embrace him that way. And you will never have to face the wrath of the lamb. He will lead you. He will feed you. He will quench your thirst. He will give you the greatest joys. This is the true testimony of the word of God. Will you this very moment cry out to him? Perhaps in the quietness of this moment, right now, that's exactly what you're doing. You are crying out from your heart and saying, Lord, save me. Save my soul. I, I want to make you my Lord and my master. I, I don't want to live for my sin. I want to live for the Savior. I want to live for my Lord. Are you praying that right now? Perhaps for the first time in your entire life, you're praying that right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, please, for just total privacy for everyone here, I'd just like for you to do this. Would you allow me to pray for you? And just by the upraised hand right now, say, Pastor, please pray for me. That's what I'm praying in my heart. I do want to embrace him as my lamb. I do not want to face him as the mighty lamb in judgment. Pray for me. Anyone at all, please pray for me. Father, I praise you and thank you so much for the joy of your word and what it means to all of us here. The joy of anyone who truly knows you is rejoicing today over the goodness and kindness of our God in this passage. Thank you that you will shepherd us and quench our thirst and, and lead us in your wonderful shepherding ways all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord today, for that soul that is nearest hell, I cry out to you for them, Lord, and ask, Lord, would you bring them forth alive just like you brought me forth alive and just like you brought so many people in this room forth alive? Would you bring them forth alive by your great power? We pray in Jesus' name.